Okay, I think we are ready to begin. Um, so first, I just want to ensure that everyone can hear me. So if you don't mind, if you can type yes into the into the chat box, it's just on the left hand side of your screen there. Wonderful. Okay, I'm seeing lots of yeses. That's great. Um, all right. Well, welcome to Asthma Canada's Asthma Basics webinar series. Uh, our webinar series has been made possible through educational grants from AstraZeneca, Novartis, GSK, and Sanofi Genzyme. Uh, today, we're getting back to basics uh, with the third installment of our webinar series, which focuses on asthma medications. Uh, so this webinar is for both people who are newly diagnosed and for those who have been living with asthma for a while. So I know many of you have been looking forward to this presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so my name is Kristen Vawa, and I'm the Manager of Communications at Asthma Canada. Uh, I'll be your host today. So before we begin, I'll go over a couple of quick uh, housekeeping points. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and we'll have it on our website shortly. So absolutely feel free to share within your networks once we make the recording public. Um, you've probably noticed that all attendees are muted, but at any point, if you have any questions or comments, um, please type into that chat box. I'll be monitoring it throughout. Um, there's also a little blue question mark at the top of your screen. Uh, you can type your, your questions there. Uh, there will be a Q&A at the end. Um, but yeah, feel free to type your questions as we move through the presentation so that you don't forget. Oops. There we go. So quickly, I will just highlight some of our work. Um, Asthma Canada is the only national organization solely dedicated to helping all Canadians affected by asthma. Um, at the heart of all we do is our vision to empower every child and adult with asthma in Canada to live an active and symptom-free life. We are committed to improving the lives of the Canadian asthma community through education and support services, advocacy, and research. Um, we encourage self-management by helping our community take control of their symptoms. Uh, we do this through our educational resources and services like our Asthma and Allergy Helpline and our webinar series, just like this one. Um, we're also committed to bringing your voice to the forefront of policy decisions that affect our community, advocating on important issues like sustainable, clean air and energy, choice and access to treatments, and access to medication in schools. And of course, we support research into better health outcomes and the eventual cure for asthma. Our national research program supports graduate level students studying early or late onset asthma. So much of the work that we do uh, is through our community of volunteers and members across the country. Uh, people living with asthma, their families, parents, caregivers, healthcare professionals, educators, and others who are strongly committed to improving asthma care and quality of life. Uh, the Asthma Canada Member Alliance is a free membership of Canadians who engage in all the work we do and who provide support and input into our initiatives. So I absolutely welcome you to join us uh, if you haven't already. And now I'd like to introduce our distinguished presenter, Dr. Lee, at the top of your screen there. Um, Dr. Lee is a medical doctor who is a fellow in clinical immunology and allergy at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, fellow of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, Immunology, and fellow of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. He is the past section head uh, of asthma for the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, and current member of the Biologics and Therapeutics Committee at the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. So thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Lee. Um, I'm especially delighted to welcome you back as a presenter. <laughs> and uh, yeah, happy to pass the presentation over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and it's a delight and pleasure to be here. And I'm very grateful and thankful for some of the very good advocacy work you do. and. You know, I think uh, I'm the friendly allergist here. A big part of my practice is asthma. It's been a big part of my research focus as well. So <clears throat> I want to go and talk about the basics of asthma and in particular focus on how we assess and the medications that we use. Um, for every 10 patients that I'll be referred for a quote unquote severe asthma, it turns out about nine out of 10 of them actually don't have severe asthma but just have kind of poorly managed asthma. And hopefully you get a sense of, you know, what I do uh, when I see a patient in consultation. Um, you know, I'm going to try to make this as 
less didactic as possible, but more going through uh, some of the tools and ways I assess patients. <clears throat> so my disclosures mainly surround uh, the research in asthma, but other conditions like rare conditions and asthma, eczema, nasal polyps, um, and a few work in urticaria and atopic dermatitis as well. So um, I didn't know this until recently, but Asthma Canada, you know, some of the other great work they do is they have booklets on pretty much everything you need to know about asthma, including a specific booklet on medications. If you have any confusion or any further reading you want to do, I think this is a great resource. I had a, a read through prior to making this presentation and couldn't believe how uh, wonderful it was. So my objective really in this hour is to look about what is good asthma control? What does this look like? We're going to talk about the medications to get there so that patients are enabled to live their fullest life and to their fullest potential without feeling limitations or any barriers. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about using the asthma action plan. Um, I personally don't employ this very much, but occasionally I do, and I'll tell you when I think it's you know a good use of it. And then we're going to go over proper uh, device technique, which is you know, quite literally the three minutes that can determine whether or not that patient has an exacerbation and is both compliant, but also adherent to their therapy. So asthma control criteria, <clears throat> these are questions that I'll ask in a patient with, you know, who's coming to me with a diagnosis of asthma or a newly diagnosis of asthma. This is also the set of questions that I will ask in every follow-up visit to get a sense of how they're doing are they really controlled or are they not so you know uh, every country has their own specific guidelines and numbers that they fixate on and you know it, sometimes you get the impression that it's a bit arbitrary but there is some consensus around the world in what constitutes controlled asthma so this conversation as you'll note and the way i'm going to present it is exactly the way i would talk to someone in clinic so i'll ask you know if they're on bentolin or salbutamol or Bricanil, uh, one of these fast relieving uh, relievers, how often do you use it? Do you feel that you need to use it? You know, on an average week, round it out for me, in the past week, how many times have you used it? So what we're looking for is less than four doses a week to consider a controlled asthma. Then I'll ask, have you ever had to miss work or school because of asthma symptoms? Again, a very simple, quick question. No one should be missing school or work, but if they are, it's a chance and an opportunity to address this. At night, are you waking up with symptoms? How do you feel in the morning? Does it ever wake you up? Wheezing, coughing, chest tightness, shortness of breath? And again, we're aiming for less than one per week. Or if you want to remember the number four, less than four times a month. And your physical activity. You know, you, you people have the misperception, uh, and maybe it's from literature from, you know, I'm, I'm talking about fictional literature where asthmatics are seen as kind of frail, um, you know, invalid-like. But no, if your asthma is controlled, you should be able to do everything you want, like someone who has no asthma, without limitation. Then we're looking at daytime symptoms. Again, the same symptoms, symptoms, wheezing, coughing, chest tightness, shortness of breath. How many times a week do you experience this? And we we're really looking for less than four times a week. And if they can't really average it out for you, you can ask the question to kind of, you know, really get an answer. How about in the past week? How many times have you had symptoms? Exacerbations, ideally, the answer is zero. You shouldn't have any asthma attacks or asthma flares. They should be mild and infrequent and very self-limited. It shouldn't, you know, incapacitate anyone uh, for days on end or weeks on end. If you have the ability to do the lung function, okay, and a couple of my patients have actually bought portable spirometers during the pandemic to me measure their own uh, FEV1, but you can get a peak flow meter as well as a kind of a second best. You want to target 90% of the personal best and Really, the difference between measuring it at nighttime and daytime should be less than 10%, ideally, um, because variable airflow 
is really the nature of asthma, and it tends to vary if the asthma is not controlled. And lastly, and again, I don't personally do this. There's a sputum criteria as well. Sputum is, you know, not as benign as people think it is. It's uh, you need to expectorate uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, I'm not sure if it'll make it into the newer criteria in Canada, but one of the things that I do for my patients uh, here at Toronologist, if they're very difficult to manage or treat, assuming they're not a smoker, we can actually do a pheno measurement, which is something called the fractional exhaled nitric oxide. Your body produces this in response to dealing with threats. Usually it's in the th context when we evolved it to deal with things like infections, but it's a global marker of how active your airway immunity is. So that's kind of what I ask. You know, another way of visualizing and conceptualizing it is these like five bubbles here. And this was, you know, suggested for the ER uh, physician, but it's a tool that any doctor can use and you can ask yourself to is really these five simple questions. Do you wake up with chest tightness? Yes or no? How many times do you use your rescue inhaler? So that's the Ventolin, Salbutamol, Bricanel, um, that kind of thing. And how many of these canisters do you go through in a year? If a person is controlled in their asthma, and if you work out the math of how many doses are in an inhaler, they should use less than one canister per year. In fact, use of four or more canisters per year, we now know is an independent risk factor for something, someone having a bad asthma exacerbation. So really we're looking for one. And as a clinician, I never prescribe more than one. I'll intentionally put zero refills. And because if someone needs a refill within the same year, before their follow-up, I would like to know about it. Because that's a fairly clear indication that the asthma is not controlled. And I do want to know about this. And unfortunately, there's no you know email or alert system that tells me that someone has been filling their inhaler elsewhere, like at a walk-in clinic or emergency. But this is my way of trying to address this as much as possible. Next question is, is there anything you can't do or would like to do but can't because of asthma? And again, um, very simple question. Uh, and like I said, you should be able to leave or lead a very normal life without limitations if the asthma is controlled. <clears throat> Have you been to a hospital, ER, or walk-in clinic because of asthma since I last saw you? Again, this is a good question because it suggests that they needed a, a more of a urgent visit for asthma, The things kind of rapidly deteriorated. And one of the goals of therapy is to smooth out the peaks and troughs of someone's asthma symptoms to make it less labile and the propensity for someone to react a lot less. So this is a great question because it kind of identifies when you've broken through. And the next question is, have you needed antibiotics or oral steroids or systemic steroids for asthma? And again, I aim for zero. And most asthmatics, if they're controlled, will have zero prednisone. I haven't, you know, I personally have asthma. I haven't needed prednisone since I was like 12. But this is something that uh, can occur and, you know, Unfortunately, it's far too easy to write a prednisone prescription than trying to retool and reassess how we can optimally manage the asthma. There's another tool here. It's called the 30-second asthma test. Very easy. It should, you know, by its name, take 30 seconds. <clears throat> and really, you're addressing the question, how do you know if your asthma is well managed? And the first question asks, again, it's very similar to the first series of questions I based on the Canadian Thoracic Society guidelines, but do you cough, wheeze, or have chest tightness because of your asthma? No, four or more days a week, simple yes or no, okay. Does coughing, wheezing, or chest tightness wake you up at night? Again, simple yes or no, it should be less than one day a week. Do you stop exercising because of your asthma? Um, so again, like a lot of people get very easily habituated to their symptoms, and they think that not being able to you know, play a full half of a soccer game is normal and they just think they're out of shape or this is part of who they are. But really, you know, you should be able to do what you need. Your legs, you know, the lungs supposed to be one of the most efficient organs in terms of the uh, mechanics of the muscles. So your legs should be tiring up before your breathing tires you out. So do you stop exercising in the past three months? Yes or no? 
Next question is, do you ever miss work or school because of your asthma? And again, no one should be missing work or school. So the answer should be no, but it gives you a quick yes or no. The last question, again, relates to the four times a week thing. It's another way of asking it, really, but it's a medication use is always kind of more objective. So it asks, do you use your rescue medication or blue popper? Okay, they're usually all blue. Um, four or more times a week, okay, except one dose per day for exercise. That's what they allow in this uh, uh, scoring system. And again, it's yes or no. So if you answer yes to one or more questions, it's time to talk to somebody, a healthcare professional, about asthma. And it's an opportunity uh, not a failure, but it's an opportunity to, you know, kind of retweak and manage the situation a bit better. The, this is, um, you know, a copy of a uh, asthma controlled questionnaire. And this is literally a copy I found lying around in my office. I just used it, so I didn't put the patient's uh, name, just filled in the date uh, while I was preparing for this presentation. But it asks very, very similar questions. And, you know, you get uh, more of a numerical gradation of symptoms. And, you know, it starts usually no symptoms or never, not at all. Um, and then it kind of gives you a more granular, detailed breakdown of all the questions that we have just addressed. So in a telephone visit, we're in the era where some things are done by telephone or virtual visits. This is a tool I can you know, easily go over the questions within two, three minutes. So, you know, I, I get that clinicians and doctors are always over uh, stressed or overworked. There's not enough hours in the day. But, you know, watching someone use an inhaler, administering this, taking the, you know, pertinent history really should take you only 10, 15 minutes at most. So, we liked, I, I like the ACQ because it's a you know, validated scoring system and it's something that we can use over time. So typically I employ this at the six month follow up or the one year follow up at the very least, just to get a sense of how that patient's really doing. This is what we want to avoid. And then asthmatic. So this is a postmortem of someone who's unfortunately passed away from an asthma exacerbation. You know, what's obviously wrong with this picture is that you know, the lungs are like a balloon. So if you take it out and everything is open, uh, it should be deflated. So here we're seeing a fully inflated lung. And the reason why this, you know, kills people is that the air cannot fully get out. And so you can no longer do the gas exchange that you require. So what's happening is if you section this lung, is that you got these mucus plugs. And this illustrates very well why you can't over rely on blue inhalers like the reliever medications. The reliever medications just really relax the muscles, but it doesn't address the underlying inflammation. So eventually the inside gets filled up with gunk, no better word for it, and that gunk prevents you from breathing out. Breathing in is an active process. Your muscles pull in, your diaphragm goes down, and it can create negative pressure. So it can kind of overcome some of these obstructions. But breathing out is a passive process where your muscles of your breathing relax and rely on the holes being open to be able to push out. So it's kind of like if you have a balloon, if you stick a pencil in there or something, you can't blow it out as fast. Uh, that's essentially what's happening until you can't blow it at all, which is the worst case scenario. We can see this mucus plugging occur if you CT a patient. And, you know, now the ACTs are amazing. You can slice the image in any different way you want. So you can slice it coronally, sagittally, uh, transversely. Uh, but when you section the lung, you see that you can actually see the mucus plugging up the airways. And again, this is what's going to, you know, make you more prone to infections, make you more prone to getting even more gunk until this is addressed. Obviously, if there's an infection triggering it, you want to treat with antibiotics, but you want to make sure that there's an, enough anti-inflammatories. What this results in is, you know, you can imagine uh, a tree, let's say a nice, uh, you know, oak tree or birch tree. The branches get smaller and smaller. So when you get to the ends at the alveoli and that gunk is sitting there, um, at the very end of the lung, there's no muscle. So you can't, it's hard to expectorate this stuff. 
And what results is those alveoli, if they, if they stop seeing oxygen, eventually die off. And over time, what this leads to is a loss of lung function that you can measure as a best proxy by something called FEV1. So here, that's what it's showing. Usually, um, in a lot of asthmatics, it can be any cell, but eosinophils can produce a lot of this gunk. So they produce something called eosinophilic cationic protein. Uh, there's stuff called matrix metalloproteases. There's goblet cells that produce mucus. So again, you know, this is a situation we don't want to end up. So that's why those questions about how often you use your, you know, reliever medication are important because ideally when things are controlled, we have, you know, we, we don't need those reliever medications. Um, I'm a big fan of the Global Initiative for Asthma or GINA guidelines for uh, learning how to treat and adjust doses of medications when you're managing asthmatics. So if you see me in clinic, if you, you know, have the fortune or misfortune of having me as your doctor, uh, I pretty much follow this to the T. Um, so there are a few critical changes that started occurring around 2017 and 2018 officially is that you know, we're trying to phase out the use of Ventolin or reliever medications as this sort of first step. So we used to think of asthma as, um, you know, a bronchospasm condition, but now we know that the bronchospasm is caused by inflammation. So we have an inf inflammation mindset when it comes to controlling asthma. So, you know, this previous category of mild intermittent asthma, where you can use as needed you know, Ventolin or uh, Salbutamol or wherever you are, it might be Albuterol in the U.S. Um, we have tried to phase this out. And the reason for this is that on a macro level, both at an individual level, but really at a macro level, if you prevent and discourage this, you actually save a lot of lives, especially if you extrapolate it to uh, an entire population or, or, or a country. So we want to start off with something that gives you the relief but also has the anti-inflammatory. So something like ICS from Adderall, <clears throat> which is really in Canada, Simbicor, um, to both relieve, relax the muscles, but also address the underlying gut. It's kind of like auto-regulating how, how much anti-inflammatory you need. You'll see at step two and step three, this is also the preferred approach, but now we want to add, start adding regular doses of the inhaled steroid if the patient is not controlled and so on and so forth. So this exists all the way to step four. Um, and then on step five, you're adding medications. Again, you know, um, I love this newer approach and newer take on the treatment of asthma. It's sort of the way that I've done it personally for 20 years, but I think, you know, there was much smaller studies done before. It just wasn't enough to change guidelines and evidence, but this, there were many small studies suggesting that this is a much better way of approaching asthma than having everyone one size fits all dose and, you know, using the uh, as needed uh, Ventol Ventolin or, or SABA, we call it short acting bronco, uh, bronco agonist or beta agonist. Um, so the low dose ICS uh, taken whenever uh, SABA is taken, that's kind of, you know, it's still listed as an other option because people will still like that approach, but it's the um, inferior option to treat the asthma. So, you know, uh, I just highlighted here the ICS, so inhaled steroid for Adderall is the preferred reliever for patients prescribed maintenance and reliever therapy. Um, and, you know, for all others, you can use uh, ICS lava or reliever, and you will still need something like uh, SABA. So if you're, for example, if you're using Advair, or if you're using Brio, um, you will still need a Ventolin on top for the reliever because that beta agonist is slow acting, but long lasting. It's not fast acting and long lasting like Fometerol. <clears throat> There's a perception that only the severe asthmatics like Gina step four and five are the ones who have exacerbations and end up in hospital. So I mentioned that there's, you know, a macro benefit to treating everyone with inhaled steroid plus fast acting bronchodilator that may happen to be long acting. So 
Again, it's a big misconception that uh, only the severe asthmatics react. So if you look at the right graph there, that's a pretty big study. Um, we're looking at classifying people based on their, you know, GINA, Global Initiative for Asthma, Severity of Asthma. It's hard to probably make out on your screen, but, you know, each of these bars has, you know, a lot of patients. For example, GINA 1, it's like, uh, you know, more than 1,000 patients, GINA 2,000 patients. And if you ask the question, how many of you required oral steroids at any point in the last year? About a quarter of GINA, step one, so these are the mild, quote-unquote, asthmatics, have needed prednisone. It's about 30% at GINA step two. And of course, it's more the more severity of asthma you have at three and four, where the four patients, about you know two almost two thirds, will require prednisone in the preceding year. Um, so, you know, again, the perception is that only the severe people have prednisone requiring exacerbations, but prednisone is used quite a bit, and even at the uh, quote unquote mild. If you look at the left uh, bar graph there, the colorful one. Um, you know, this kind of explains the right graph. If you look at the various treatment steps or, or the severity of asthma according to Gina and <clears throat> where they are long, um, when you apply actual real control criteria, doctors and patients always think, you know, patients are doing great. Uh, if, 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 if no one's complaining, you assume that they're great. But when you ask those questions and actually systemically ask them, you know, is any exercise limited? Do you need to, you know, use your SABA? Do you have limitations? Do you experience nighttime? When you apply these criteria, you find that even at the quote-unquote step one and two asthma, about half of them are actually uncontrolled at step one, and about 43% uncontrolled at step two. And of course, at four, this is kind of expected, but about half are not controlled. And at step five, as you can imagine, this the most severe end of the spectrum, 84% are not controlled. So again, um, you know, people think that they're doing well, but they are actually habituated to how poorly their baseline is. And, you know, it's kind of like you don't know what you don't know unless you're really tested. So background to changes. So the, you know, the, the hammer came down in 2019, um, you know, addressing some of this evidence. So there are risks of, you know, labeling someone as a mild asthmatic, okay? So <clears throat> apparently mild asthma, you know, you're still at risk for exacerbation and serious adverse events. About a third of patients who have an acute asthma exacerbation who end up seeing ER or, you know, urgent care actually have a label of mild asthma. About 16% who have near fatal asthma, so these are the patients who are intubated or have a, you know, a complication requiring hospitalization, are actually quote unquote mild. And about a fifth of patients who die of asthma have had the label of mild asthma. Again, just to uh, illustrate how labels can lead to misconception and how the treatment uh, with uh, as needed bronchodilator can lead to problems. We know that exacerbation triggers are unpredictable and not controllable. So viruses, Anyone can get an infection at any time. Pollution, you know, both relative and acute exposure to um, pollution. Pollens, we don't know what the pollen counts are like. But we do know that generally, as a trend, because of global warming, they are trending upwards for the last 12 years or so. We've got poor adherence. Again, asthma is a condition where people feel better. You know, I was talking to my family doctor colleagues earlier this week. Uh, blood pressure is something that everyone has a home blood pressure monitor and keeps a close eye on. You know, why don't we have the same mentality for home spirometry? They're, they're, you know, some of the devices are actually quite cheap on Amazon now, on par with blood pressure monitoring. Why don't we look at monitoring FEV1? Because the more data points you have, the better of an eye you can keep on things. Again, um, I always think about the Shea Guevara documentary I watched uh, based on his life. He's always using his, uh, you know, Ventolin asthma inhaler. But this is the perception for the last 50 years that asthmatics are constantly tugging on their, you know, inhalers, usually a SABA of some kind. But it is not a bronchospasm prim primary problem. Bronchospasm is the result of inflammation. So really, um, we don't want people to over-rely on SABA treatment. 
And, you know, patients kind of buy into this too, because it gives you instant relief. But what happens is the beta receptor does change its expression and you'll need more and more to get the same relief as well. So there are many problems with this. And then, uh, of course, I mentioned the gunk that never gets expectorated properly, or, and the source and the driver of that gunk is never addressed using this approach. So patients commonly believe that you know, my asthma reliever gives me control, so they don't feel that they need an additional treatment. So you know, the clinician, like myself, has to explain some of the long-term repercussions and the macro effects of using this approach. So frequent use of SABA is associated with many adverse events. So you get the receptor downregulation, decreased bronchoprotection, and you paradoxically get a rebound hyper-responsiveness, and you get less and less of a response the more you use it. Like the muscle can only be relaxed to some degree. You actually, when you change your beta receptor um, expression, you actually increase your allergic response and you actually increase airway eosinophils. So those are the white blood cells that you know, cause a lot of the inflammation. If you use a higher amount of SABA, okay, for example, if you use more than three canisters per year, average of one or two puffs a day, okay, 1.7 to be precise, you're at much higher risk of ER presentations. And if you use more than 12, much higher risk of death. And we've known this for quite some time, as you see in my references. <clears throat> so the landmark changes to the management, you know, we no longer recommend SABA only treatment for step one, GINA step one, asthma. And again, because you end up with more exacerbations and adding an inhaled corticosteroid reduces this risk substantially without adding much side effects. Gina now recommends that all adults and adolescents with asthma should receive an ICS containing controller treatment to reduce the risk of serious exacerbation. And the ICS can be delivered by regular daily treatment in mild asthma or as needed ICS for metrol. So the fast acting, long acting beta agonist coupled with inhaled corticosteroid. So, you know, we live as neighbors to the United States of America. And they were probably the laggards in, you know, considering the safety of this approach because they had, you know, black box uh, FDA label with patients dying from using formaterol. But these patients were only using formaterol without the inhaled steroid. So that caused a lot of muddiness and confusion. In fact, at this year's conference at their American college meeting, there was an actual pro-con debate. But again, they're slow to come around because they're, you know, influenced by this. But as long as the formaterol is coupled with an inhaled steroid, you are removing the gunk and the stimulus for that gunk. So it is safe to proceed this way. And, and there's no debate anywhere else in the world. So there's a big population level risk reduction by having this change occur. You know, it's on par with what you, the magnitude of effect you get from someone taking cholesterol lowering medications and blood pressure medications for cardiovascular outcomes. So it made sense to apply these for asthma too. So individual patients may not necessarily see the benefit themselves, especially short term, but there are definitely long-term benefits and much better uh, societal benefits to doing it this way. If you're still not convinced, we look at other randomized control studies. So we look at low dose budesonide from metal, that's the semicord in mild asthma. There's uh, you know, a couple of studies, uh, 12 months, so they're quite long, open label, and uh, you know some of them are randomized, double-blinded too. So there's you know some of the references I've listed there. So what you get with this ad hoc as-needed therapy with ICS and fast-acting LABA for metrol is that you get a significant reduction in exacerbations versus using the SABA alone and versus using uh, maintenance and health corticosteroid with you know, the as-needed doses. And the symptom control is actually very comparable. I was kind of relieved when this kind of evidence started coming out because I was the non-compliant patient myself at one point and thought, uh, you know, maybe I just use this as, as needed, but I was using the Simicord. Patients with randomized control studies of this regimen in mild asthma now, you know, total on close to 10,000 patients. So we have very good evidence that this is a safe and effective strategy. And, you know, when you look at inflammatory markers in these studies, 
For example, phenol that I talked to you about, the fractional exhaled nitric oxide. Very easy one-minute test, by the way. Um, you find that there's a similar uh, you know, benefit to using an uh, and the as-needed approach versus the regular approach. The reduction in risk of severe exacerbations was independent of baseline characteristics of the patient, including blood eosinophils and fractional exhaled nitric oxide. Then there's even more evidence, other randomized control uh, studies, looking at taking inhaled corticosteroids whenever a SAPA is taken. That's two separate inhalers, so one after the other. And, you know, it's comparable, but I will say it's not as good as taking it in a combination. There is some synergistic effect. So for children age 6 to 11, okay, um, it's thought because of they're not as good perceivers of their symptoms and you know, there's more parental oversight and care, um, you know, we like to start with the daily inhaled corticosteroid if for the step two, but there's other options as well, as you'll see there. Um, kids, just like every other thing, every other, in every other condition, uh, they have something called polymorphic gene expression. So, uh, you know, they have multiple genes turned on for the same thing. And then as you get older, you start turning off some of the ones you don't use. So what, what that means is drugs like Singular or Montelukast, they tend to work better in children because they have more of these polymorphic expressors, uh, express genes. So they have more of a, uh, the key will fit the lock a bit more. But as adults, it tends to work a little bit less. So in children, you can start with uh, daily leukotriene receptor antagonist. Okay. And then as you go up, you start adding the combination inhaler, step three and step four, changing the dose of the inhaled steroid. And of course, there are now biologics approved for children uh, and not just omalizumab that's shown here, the anti-IG. There are other biologics in this range, including, uh, you know, Nucala or mepolizumab, as well as dupilumab. So initial, when, how do I know where to start a patient? The GINA guidelines actually addresses this very perfectly and, uh, and in a very detailed and evidence-based uh, fashion, okay? So essentially, you ask the patient, how often do you have symptoms? If they're really less than twice a month, you can start them at step one of the treatment arm. If they're twice a month or more, but less than every day, then you start them at step two. If it's most days or waking the person up, you know, uh, once a week or more, you start them at step three. So by the time patients see me, they usually get started on step three because that's where I usually find them. And at step four, these are patients who have symptoms on most days, wakes up at least once a week, and have a low lung function. I tend to be a bit more aggressive, and we'll start them with, uh, you know, a minimum of Simbacor, two inhalations twice daily, which is about 400 micrograms of uh, budesonide. You can consider a short course oral steroid as well, just to get immediate control. Here are the uh, starting points for children. It's very uh, similar, okay? Again, you ask them how many symptoms do they experience in a week? So your questionnaires become very helpful in directing where to start in terms of treatment. So we all know that adherence, so that's the, you know, how many times a patient actually takes the medication is, is quite low. So there's only about less than, just less than 50% adherence over six months. And you decrease this to only 30% at six months. This is kind of the problem with a waxing and waning condition. But, you know, again, the triggers are all around us, and it's, it's just really luck of the draw if you get exposed to a trigger that sets things off. So, you know, there are, these are, there's different ways to try to increase the adherence, right? You can call them and pester them. That's the personalized adherence discussion. Uh, you know, the reminders and feedback, so that's, uh, you know, they try giving uh, email and phone uh, push messages to get that adherence up. And then personalized adherence, which is, you know, that plus adherence, uh, reminders, feedback. You know, even if you do all this, like the best you can get is about 60% adherence at six months. So I think, you know, um, part of the advocacy work that I see and, you know, in my uh, work with Asthma Canada is just trying to figure out how to, you know, overcome this. Because unfortunately, in the past 20 years, the adherence rate has not budged at all. But yet this is the other reason why I like the as-needed um, you know, Simbacord or Palmacord plus Fomadrol strategy is because this is a realistic way. It's never good to be a purist when you're trying to help someone because you have to ultimately work with what 
that person is actually willing to do. You know, again, I went through an entire medical school using an as needed approach with uh, my summer court. And again, it's it's just one of these things that you need actual buy in. And I, and I believe in something called shared decision making, which is part of this. Now, how good is this approach? Well, let's look at the contrary. Uh, it's terrible to get oral steroids. And we have a lot of evidence of the cumulative risk of oral steroids. So cataracts, high blood pressure, GI issues, psychiatric conditions, uh, metabolic disorders, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, all of these things go up substantially. <clears throat> and of course, the more oral steroids you rec receive, the, uh, the worse. Uh, so there's a misperception that if you only use one week of oral steroids, it's, nothing, it's not too bad. But again, if you do that every year or even every other year, that uh, does actually unfortunately add up. So as needed, I say it's for Metarol. You know, if you're uh, a healthcare provider and providing this, you know, you have to specify what the maximum number of doses is. And the maximum is based on the formeterol content, so which is 12, uh, if you're using the 200 inhaler. Um, again, you know, if you're using it as maintenance and liver therapy for GNA steps three to five patients, or even as, as needed, uh, as part of an asthma action plan, that's kind of the where you have to play around with in terms of the dosing, okay? As needed, low dose uh, beclomethazone for mineral, so that's the Zenhale inhaler. You can do this as maintenance and reliever therapy too, although they don't have the official indication. It's essentially the same approach. And again, you can make it part of a, someone's asthma action plan. Most of my adult patients, you know, once I explain things, are able to get this uh, without it needing to be written down as a formal asthma action plan. But I will talk to you about asthma action plans because it, it does work for some people. Okay. And the maximum dose for uh, Zen Hill is 48 microgram of formeterol in this uh, formulation. So you got to do six inhalations uh, if using 100 Zen Hill. So there's many choices of respiratory medications. If someone really truly prefers, like, uh, you know, a fixed dose, then there's Advair and Brio. Um, you know, personally, I do like the auto titration method of the Zen Hill and Simbacort. So that's what I tend to favor. And again, there's a little bit differences in steroids. All of these steroids are designed to not really uh, absorb too much systemically. So it's fairly uh, safe. I know a lot of people have steroid phobias out there. Um, again, for example, the momentum is charged. It doesn't really go in easily. Uh, and the salts are a little bit tweaked to decrease the systemic absorption. If a patient's still not doing well, we can often add uh, teotropium, which is an approved uh, medication for asthma now and has been for some time. And, you know, you get a little bit of dry mucous membranes, but this does give you a little bit of extra control in a lot of patients, uh, you know, sometimes up to 5% uh, of lung function changes in a positive direction. So the poor consequences of asthma control are many, but the number one thing that most people don't realize, you know, they, they realize when they feel not so good, but they don't realize that the lung function decline is a persistent and, uh, you know, um, long-term thing. So again, from a year to year, losing 1%, 2% extra of lung function doesn't seem like a lot, but it's the law of, you know, cumulative uh, averages or law of compounding interest, if you want to call it. In 10 years, 20 years, that becomes very noticeable. So life-threatening asthma exacerbations, of course, that everyone, I think, understands that part. But the, the progressive long-term decline is something that most people don't uh, conceptualize or think about. So again, um, if you use a controller therapy that's coupled with an inhaled corticosteroid, you can prevent this. So again, here's just, uh, you know, I, I picked this study up. There's many, like as Tony Bai is a respirologist in Vancouver that I work with, and I sort of like him, so I cite his study here. But there's many studies like this showing that there's an annual decline in lung function in frequent exacerbators of lung uh, of asthma, about 30 milliliters on average, versus an asthmatic who's not having uh, or having infrequent exacerbations. Uh, just click the slide change, but it's not moving. Oh, here we go. So the CTS asthma control criteria. Again, you want to look at, they like the uh, ACQ as well. And uh, they want uh, more than 1.5 change and or an asthma control test less than 20 or a child asthma control test less than 20. Okay. So this is a criteria for severe. If you look at frequent severe exacerbation, and they define as two or more requiring steroids for at least three days. 
serious exacerbation. This is when you end up in the hospital, intubated, or in the ICU. And airflow limitation. And again, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of looking at FPV1 because it can change in the same patient wildly from one measurement to another, depending on how their asthma is controlled. But generally, if they're consistently uh, going below 80% of their personal best, that's more of a reliable indicator. And when we look at the ratio of FEV1 to FEC, it's not the percentage, but it's the absolute number. Uh, again, we don't want obstruction, so we don't want uh, to be less than 70 or 75. Um, here's a asthma action plan when I do use it. So this is back in the day, uh, the good old days where, you know, pharma could give us useful and helpful tools like this. So they gave me these uh, tear out sheets and it's lasted uh, a lifetime. Um, so you can go through this with the patient and spell out exactly what they need to do and based on exactly what their symptoms are doing and come up with a plan. There's many variations of this. So in fact, Abbott makes this one as well, okay? Which is a two pager, but the first page tells you exactly what to do in terms of your medications and you know your reliever therapy if you're on a fixed dose uh, uh, inhaler. <clears throat> on the back here, you have uh, a different variation of this. So you got green zone, yellow zone, and red zone. I think most red zone, I just tell them to call me or go to the hospital. But uh, you know it has criteria for asthma getting worse and yellow zone and doing well. And it explicitly spells out the uh, criteria. And if they are doing peak flows, you can actually put in their peak flow range that would, you know, maybe signal to them that they're in a, in a bad uh, state or expecting exacerbation. One of the tools, I, like I said, is the Pheno. I wish, you know, that was available to all centers. And, uh, you know, I, I wish we'd get a uh, OHIP billing code. I, I just do it at cost, at, at my own cost. But... You know, it's roughly about 10 for $10, you get information on how active the inflammation is. And this measure can actually help me predict who's going to have an exacerbation in the next two months. So I do love this tool, but I wish, I think it is very underutilized. Sigma 1 and 2 um, are the two big studies, and it's a Canadian-led study uh, by Hamilton, by Paul Byrne, looking at, you know, the how safe is it really? Uh, to do this ad hoc, as needed, Simbicord approach, budesonide for metaro. And what they found is that the exacerbation rates are identical to people taking it on a regular dose. Uh, the lung function is a tad lower in the ad as needed group. This is a very well-powered study. You'll see in Sigma 1, each arm has about you know close to 1,300 patients, and Sigma 2, close to 2,000 patients in each arm. So these are robust, randomized studies. And this is the study, these two studies are what was required to change the GINA guidelines. So uh, device techniques, again, I encourage every healthcare professional to actually go over it. Um, I always say, I pretend I'm a fly on the wall and just do it. Don't talk about it, just do it. And I like to grade and test people to see if they're actually doing it correctly. There are many resources online. Every company has the official uh, checked YouTube videos. If they don't like the pharma stuff, they I have a channel on YouTube. Uh, it's called Evidence Based Medical Educator, where you know a respiratory uh, therapist uh, Dale Mackey and I we actually went over uh, in a cartoon format how to take care of each inhaler and how to use every single device. But I'm not YouTube famous, unfortunately. So always go over this. Okay, in the pandemic, I've asked people to go over it with their pharmacists as well. You know, I, I, I like to secretly test my pharmacist when they were teaching my daughter how to use an inhaler. And he was actually amazing at uh, teaching uh, teaching her. So uh, you'd be, you know, you'd use all the you know, available resources. And of course, if all else fails, there's many injectable and biologic treatments for asthma. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. That was really, really informative. Um, we do have quite a few questions, so if it's okay, I'm just going to jump right into those <laughs> to see how many we can get through uh, in 10 minutes. So let's see here. That was a really great one. Um, we'll start. Um, is there an at-home spirometer you would recommend for monitoring lung function? I haven't tested them. Um, I like certain brands. Miro, M-I-R-O, is uh, some of the portable spirometers we use in our clinic, and they have made a consumer-grade one. Um, they're all available on Amazon. And, you know, I had a very motivated patient at the very start of the pandemic who was very concerned that he couldn't monitor his lung function. So we actually went through 
looking at uh, the websites together to find out which one's good for him. Um, they vary in in cost and quality though, and you know the the standardized units they look at. So just be careful and stick to like I think a good brand like Miro is a good one, but there's a couple other really good brands like 3M. But um, you know I would be cautious about just like when you're buying you know masks, be cautious about you know the actual company and or country of origin where it's produced. Fair enough. Um, <clears throat> this next question uh, comes for from Veronique, who is a mom to a three-year-old with asthma. Um, and she's asking, is it true that asthma controlled and medicated at a young age <clears throat> will <clears throat> excuse me, improve the chances that as an adult, you're going to have less effects on your health and daily life? If so, could you explain why? Yeah, long-term control is very important. Like, you know, I also have two children with uh, asthma and they're so used to the, uh, you know, the aero chambers and they're so used to taking their inhalers now. Um, so, you know, uh, like everything in life, there's risks and benefit. Uh, but I think the benefits far out number of the risks. And, you know, the main benefit is actually in children, they're still developing their lungs. Um, it's like a tree. The buds are still growing and you're still gaining lung function. That's why peak lung capacity really occurs in your early 20s and professional athletes perform their best around that time. Okay, sorry, to feed interrupted, I'm, I'm just back. Um, yeah, so they, they still have developing lungs. And if you imagine if you have gunk in there, they're not going to develop their full potential of the lungs. So it is very important to control the inflammation so that we don't lose lung function and the lungs continue to grow healthy. So, you know, many long-term repercussions and both direct and indirect uh, effects of controlling the asthma. You know, we've talked about lung function, but also just their lifestyle and health and their that habituation I talked about. You want your children to grow up, uh, hopefully to be active. There's many cardiovascular improvements and even bone mineral density of getting in good habits like exercising and being very active. So you do want to encourage that as much as possible. Um, this is another uh, question that um, touches on children. So this one comes from Emily, who asks, um, at what age can we trust a child to use their air chamber by themselves? Um, I don't have an age criteria because children mature at very different rates depending on the individual child. Uh, I think my daughter was able to do everything on her own, even at age five. And, you know, every now and then I'll check up on her and check up on her technique. She measures the number of breaths, the number of times the flap goes back and forth. And, uh, you know, um, she does a really good job. But um, again, it really is an individualized approach for children because children do mature at very different rates. Yeah, absolutely. Every individual is is unique. Um, so this next question comes from Supat, who asks, uh, is there a threshold when a corticosteroid stops working and a new medication needs to be looked at, specifically something like Flovent or another similar type? Yeah, so um, if the inhaler is not making a marked difference within a month, I will switch. Uh, assuming the compliance and adherence is there, if it's not really making one iota of difference, then I will switch. Okay, now this next question comes from, um, from Dorothy, who's actually on the call today. So Dorothy asks, um, I have issues with choking, which then causes severe breathing problems. Is that still standard asthma or should I get reassessed? Yeah, so um, there's actually several studies showing that asthmatics choke a lot more, okay? Because your um, you know, airway dynamics are affected by having to work a little bit harder to pull in air, the pressure gradient sometimes it sets up, um, you know, it actually encourages flow into your larynx and not your esophagus. Sorry, it says interrupted for some reason. I'm, I apologize, the internet is not so good at my office. Can you oh. hear me? We can hear you okay, I think. Okay, okay, perfect, um, perfect. I certainly haven't had an issue, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, so asthmatics do choke a bit more. If the asthma control is better, you should be choking less, but it's kind of like the chicken or the egg. Choking does cause uh, bronchospasm in people and can set off an asthma exacerbation. So try to stay on top of the asthma and you know you should choke less. 
Um, you know, asthmatics are also more at risk for obstructive sleep apnea, again, for some of the similar aerodynamic changes that occur. Uh, because you're pulling a little bit harder, um, again, it tends to get that soft uh, tissue in the back of the throat uh, down a bit more too. Okay, so this next question comes from Myrna, who asks, um, what do I do when Ventolin doesn't seem to be working and my inhaler is current? Okay, so if your Ventolin is not working, like so number one, you should be using your Ventolin only as a reliever for relief. And if it's not working, you know, you don't have many options but other than to go to the hospital and, uh, and be assessed because it should work. You know, if, if it's not an acute setting, you could try changing it to something like Brickenell uh, which is a, you know, slightly different bronchial agonist. So we can try something like that. Okay. So this one is, um, going to be very relevant very soon. <laughs> um, Melissa asks, uh, how to control asthma during the winter when there's lots of cold air? Um, is it best to use Simbaport? Yeah. So, um, it's interesting. So again, we, we used to conceptualize exercise as a different trigger, we conceptualize cold air as a trigger. So asthmatics always, uh, you know, cough a lot or have asthmatic symptoms after eating ice cream or something really cold beverage. Um, so, you know, cold is just another trigger for asthma, just like exercise is just another trigger. You know, we don't think of these as distinct entities now. If your asthma is controlled, cold air shouldn't bother you too much. Okay, so it's just, think of it just like an allergen or being exposed to, you know, cigarette smoke. Like, you know, you can only be triggered if you have asthma that's uncontrolled. And, you know, we do a task called methicoline challenge where we try to intentionally induce asthma. And in that test, you know, by the definition of the test, you can only be induced if your asthma is not controlled or, you know, or if you're not on therapy. In fact, a full asthmatic can have a negative methicoline if they're on inhaler. So you know, just again, reinforcing hopefully the message that if your asthma is controlled, you should really be not triggered so easily. Okay, I think we will do two more questions if that's okay with you, Dr. Lee. Sure. Okay, so this next one comes from uh, Stephen, who's on the call with us today. Um, and Stephen shares that um, he's recently developed anaphylaxis allergies to certain food products, uh, namely walnuts, pecans, hazelnuts. Uh, he's 48 years old and had asthma beforehand um, and has had two very close calls with these allergies, like rush to the ER, prednisone, etc. cetera. Um, but his asthma symptoms remain for about three weeks post allergy attack. So he says these in incidents made him lose his voice and it's all very new to him. And he wants to know if this is relatively normal or what additional steps. Yeah, this is an excellent question, actually. Yeah, it's a very good yeah. question. A lot of people don't realize that when you have a food allergy, um, asthma is the single most important risk factor on whether or not you have a bad reaction to that food or not. So and when looking at anaphylaxis, the anaphylaxis severity is number one predicated on the asthma control. So this is another reason to really get on top of the asthma, especially if you have a food allergy. So, you know, the, the tree allergies, tree nut allergies here, it looks like in this case, um, you know, will you'll have less of a bad reaction in case there's an accidental ingestion if your asthma is well controlled. And it's again, like the chicken or the egg. So one inflammatory stimulus, like a food anaphylaxis reaction can cause a cascade it's the same part of the immune system uh, called type 2 inflammation. It goes into overdrive, which affects things like asthma. Uh, and again, it can affect the skin as well and other type 2 inflammatory conditions. But um, yeah, one thing can trigger another because uh, they're all kind of interconnected. We have a very siloed approach to medicine where, you know, the lung specialist will see the lung, the dermatologist will see the skin, the ENT will see the ear and the nose. But these systems are all within one body and controlled by one immune system at the end of the day. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Stephen, for, for that question. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. I think, I think we'll actually leave it there. Um, I, we're at the end of our time. So I just, we appreciate so much you taking the time to, to give us this presentation. Um, and thank you to everyone for attending and, and your great questions. Um, 
I know we didn't get to a few, so absolutely please email us at info at asthma.ca and we'll be happy to help. Um, Dr. Lee also mentioned um, asthma action plan and our Breathe Easy medications booklet. So um, I posted the link at the beginning, but absolutely please um, please do visit our website and that resource section specifically. So um, another resource is our helpline, which I did mention at the beginning, but absolutely um, email, call, and we'll be happy to connect you um, with the information that you need. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone.